<clears throat> thank you so much for um, welcoming Kelly and I, and uh, just so glad to be here with you folks. Uh, congratulations on your awards and just things that you're doing here locally in our community, in the uh, United States, and for the world. I'm just so impressed. And I love your mission statement. Um, you have one purpose, and it's to serve others above yourself, and I think that's awesome. So anyway, we're glad to be here. We're going to be talking to you today about a mission trip that we leave on in just a few weeks. We are going to go to Kenya. Um, we leave June 4th, and um, we will be serving children with autism at the oldest government-run school. It's called Jacaranda Special School. Um, <clears throat> kind of how we ended up, let's see, I didn't prepare this speech, but I'm trying to figure out how I want to talk to you. Let me talk to you first about how jewelry, because that is kind of uh, what we're doing, and we... Through How Jewelry, we learned of this need. How Jewelry was developed by Janine Maxwell, which most of you have probably heard of Heart for Africa before. Uh, I know one of your members, Jimmy, is the president of that here stateside. And Janine developed How Jewelry. How stands for Helping Orphans and Widows. And she developed it when, when Heart for Africa was working in Kenya. They came across a large group of widows in the mountains of Kinegal and they were all living with HIV and AIDS. Their husbands had died and had, had infected them first. And some of these women, even their children, had preceded them in death, and so they were raising their grandchildren. They needed a way to make a honest living. They needed a way to raise their grandchildren, provide education, food, healthy diet, this kind of a thing. And so we have 26 widows that currently are making jewelry for how jewelry. We um, pay them up front, so all the jewelry we have, they are everything that they make, they've been paid for, and we bring it to the United States, and we use it um, for fundraising opportunities for um, people who are going on mission trips, um, folks who want to do clean water projects. We've recently partnered with Room for One More, another non-for-profit raising awareness and funds for adoptions and foster care. Um, really, our mission is, has anything to do with helping orphans and widows in the name of Christ. And so, um, when we have folks who are doing these types of fundraisers for their work, they can share about their project, they can have the jewelry there, and it's a tangible way for people then to be able to give to their project. But then when you go out in the community and someone sees, you know, what you're wearing, it's also a way to share what's going on with these women. So the company has been going on for about six, seven years. And I recently acquired it a little over a year ago, and we're turning it into a non-for-profit. The way my husband and I are running it is we are returning all of the profits back to the work in Africa, benefiting women and children living in extreme poverty. Um, so last year, um, I went to Kenya for the first time and absolutely fell in love with the women. My heart has always been for children. My family's adopted twins from um, Ethiopia about four years ago. And I just wasn't sure what the Lord was doing with um, How Jewelry and me, but um, he, clearly, he clearly showed me that um, you know, his heart is for widows and we're all called to serve them. But um, so it was, it was just an incredible time. It was a time of just celebration. And we developed, they developed a signature piece at that time with us called the Widow's Might. And it's a bracelet that all the profits from this one bracelet goes into a special widow's fund because we're not selling enough jewelry at this point in time to fully support these women. Um, most of what they're making, they are paying people to till their land because they all have um, land and, and they feed their families with the produce that they make off of their farms. But because they're weak, they're not healthy, they're not eating a proper diet full of protein, especially when you're sick and you have an immune compromised disease, they're paying stronger men in the community than to till their land for them. So we, just, we, we know that we need to do some microfinance loans for them to get them started um, in some type of small business. We have one widow who was able to purchase a sewing machine. It was a used sewing machine. And it's one that she um, pedals by um, her own energy. But she's now doing some tailoring, um, making some clothes, doing mending, those kinds of things. Um, we have one widow who makes soap and sells soap. 
And so it's, you know, we're trying to find some other sustainable forms of income for them. Um, while we were there, we um, went into the city of Nairobi and we visited Jacaranda Workshop. I had bought some earrings, because I'm interested in jewelry, as you know. I bought some earrings at a fair trade store in St. Louis, and they said they were made by adults with developmental disabilities. And it was made in Nairobi at Jacaranda Workshop. So prior to my trip, I had um, done some communication with Tina in Nairobi, and she said, please come and see what we do. And um, I said, well, I'd just be excited to come. So we have an in-country coordinator, her name is Kezia, and she has worked for Hal Jewelry for over five years. So it's really nice to have that, never been in that country before, to have a contact person. Kezia is also the person who goes to the market, buys the beading, those kinds of things, and takes them to the widows and teaches them how to make this, you know, this design of a necklace or this bracelet or uh, beading a basket, those kinds of things. So Kezia, because she knows her a whole way around, made my trip a lot easier. And so she took me to Jacaranda School. And we went into the school, quickly figured out that we were in the school and not the workshop, although they are on both the same property. But the headmaster was so excited to see us, she, kept, she was in a meeting, but she kept sticking her head out and saying, don't let my visitors leave, don't let my visitors leave. Well, we clearly knew we were in the wrong place and wanted to get onto the workshop so we could see what was going on there. But we waited. And so we were all sitting down with her. Holly Brantley was with me on this trip, and my daughter Peyton, who was 13 at the time, and Kezia and her husband David. And so the five of us were sitting in her office, and it wasn't just a couple of minutes before she started telling me about this new population of children with autism that they're seeing in the school. And just a few months prior to that, one of the twins that we adopted and one of our children was diagnosed with autism. And so at this point in time, I knew that this was a divine appointment, that it was no accident that we were at the school. And I started sharing with her, in just the few months that Felix had been in therapy, the tremendous change that had been made in him. He was a child who did not care for any social interaction. He didn't, well, maybe he did avoid us. But he liked to be by himself. He liked to do things that just, you know, we, we didn't know anything about autism. We really didn't want to know anything about autism, but we learned a lot. And in three months, there was this child who preferred to be by himself in a totally separate room, who is now in the same room with us, maybe starting out in the middle of the room playing with whatever he's doing or interacting with, coming over, sitting at my feet if I'm on the couch. Pretty soon, he's climbing up on the couch next to me. And then, in just a couple more minutes, we're now interacting. Eye contact has improved by 80% in just three months. He's realizing that I'm a valuable person to him. You know, that people have value, and that's what we need for children with autism. So I tell you that, and I'm telling this to um, the director of the school, the headmistress, and she kindly, you know, we kind of wrap up, and I said, I want to send you some information, because, you know, I feel like we're just starting to understand autism here in America. And um, the rates of autism now are one in 50 children have been diagnosed, are on the spectrum somewhere. And they say it's a spectrum, um, but that's a lot of children. It's, it's, it's the highest growing, I don't know if you call it a disease or developmental problem, but it's higher than childhood cancer and AIDS and diabetes <coughs> and everything. And it doesn't get a lot of attention. So we went to the workshop. We got to see what they're doing, how they make their jewelry there. We bought a lot of jewelry, and we were so excited to partner with them and to bring their jewelry back to the United States to share with people here. We felt like there would be a real market for it. It is um, kind of whimsical, and it's not all perfect, but it's been very popular. I brought everything that I had left from them today, and it's not much, but I'm so excited to go back. So when I came back, I started sharing with our therapy team um, about this meeting with the headmaster and about these children that they're really not knowing what to do with in Africa. And um, we have a, a fantastic team. And one of the people on our team is Kelly. And she is a music therapist who works with children with autism. And <clears throat> when I started sharing with our team, because they were really excited about what we were doing, and I showed them pictures and things, and um, they said, 
oh my gosh, we want to go. We want to go and help that school. And I was just, I was just like, oh my gosh, really? And, and so we said, okay, let's do this. And how do we do it? I've never led a mission team before. I've only been in the jewelry business for six or eight months at that time. And, but anyway, God has just really um, blessed um, us. And he is just blessing orphans and widows in Kenya. And he's going to be blessing the socks off these kids with autism there. They are so excited for us to come. The teachers are just wanting to pick their brains. They're wanting any type of, you know, ideas and training that they can get. Um, I'm going to let Kelly tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing. And um, thank you very much. And then we'll show you a video when we're to be honest, we're still figuring out what we're going to be doing, and I'm sure the first trip will be kind of uh, a learning experience for us. I know that it will be difficult to get done as much as we want to get done. Um, but my experience with children with autism, I've worked at Life Skills Touchpoint Autism Services for 13 years. These are my favorite kids on earth. I work with kids with other special needs as well. Um, but if there's any population of children in the world that we have to understand how to help them and how to interact with them, it's children with autism. And in the United States, our services are getting better, but even in the United States, it's really difficult for people to understand the sensory issues and what we need to do for children with autism. So when I thought about children in Kenya with individuals that these folks don't have any training about the sensory issues and all of that, I've done some research on services in Kenya, and they do have some services, applied behavior analysis service for those kids, but only people um, with the greatest amount of wealth in the country can access that, which is, a, is an issue, of course. All, all children, regardless of their um, ability to pay, should have some ability to have appropriate services. So we are going over there to hopefully work with some of those children, give them ideas. It's hard to just say, okay, here's what you should do with children with autism because every child is very different. And um, that's why we have the puzzle piece as the emblem for music therapy, or not for music therapy, for autism, because um, every kid is a puzzle and we have to figure out how do they work and what do they need and all of that. So we want to train those folks and how do we put those pieces together to figure out what this kid needs. So that is our hope, to go over there and train everyone. Um, on some ideas, things that they can try. Um, of course, we worry about the language barrier a little bit, but I am assured that a lot of people speak English. Um, and I think as a music therapist, I don't know how familiar any of you are with music therapy, um, but a music educator teaches music. As a music therapist, I use music to teach things that are non-musical. So I might use music, um, use instruments to work on fine motor skills, which is a big issue for kids with autism. I might um, use singing to work on creating sounds and creating later on words and being able to speak. Um, any sort of thing like that. So to me, I have an advantage as a music therapist because I have the music. I don't always need the language because the music is the language. Um, I always thought I wanted to go on a mission trip, and I always thought, how am I going to do all that? How am I going to get that worked out? Joe's going to have the kids all week. He's going to be stressed out. Uh, so, <laughs> and so uh, I, I thought about it a lot, and thought, oh, it's just not the right time. But when Michelle came to me about this issue, you know, and sometimes you wonder, well, what exactly can I do? In this place, I know what I can do. So I thought, this is when I'm supposed to go. Joe, I hope you survive the couple of weeks, but uh, this is the time that I'm supposed to go. So I think one of the neatest parts of the experience, um, I was talking to Jim Riley, and Jim Riley said to me, you guys all know, if you know him, he's a character. He told me that what he liked about it is that we're not giving people fish, we're teaching them to fish. And that's what I, all of the Hard for Africa, How Jewelry, all of that, uh, even the Haiti programs, all of those, that's exactly what we need to be doing. Give those people the skills to do what, what they need. Um, so the folks at the Jacaranda workshop made these beautiful autism bracelets, and I wear mine every day, and it's, I'm actually going to have to buy another one pretty soon because it's starting to wear out, I wear it so much. Um, but the, the folks at the Jacaranda school made the autism bracelets for us to sell, and $10 of that goes back to the people that made the bracelet, and then $20 goes to send a therapist over there to train the staff and to work with the children, which I think is a great program. We've also... Um, some t-shirts that we made, um, those are $25 and $10 of that um, goes for creating the t-shirts, but $15 goes to send a therapist over there. Um, I guess that's most of what I have to say about it. We'll show a few um, photos of the Jacaranda workshop and videos of some of the folks.
gave an eighth of an acre of her property to build the building. Two years ago it was built.
items that the ladies have made and again we just thank you and um, um, thank you so much for letting us share about what we're doing and um, thank you for what you all do. 